Hello everyone and welcome to week four of Hymnology. Uh, and this week it is Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. I uh, hope you're doing well and excited about this week. Um, let's just get right to it. There's a good bit to cover in this. And uh, so starting with some background information of the song, it's, it's greatly debated on when this song was written. They kind of have a general idea, but they all agree, pretty much every, all researchers and, and uh, musical scholars agree that a gentleman by the name of Robert Robinson wrote the song. Uh, roughly in the 1750s, uh, 58 or 59, it kind of goes back and forth. But when it's that old, I really don't think it matters. Um, and so this song, we, we have been singing in the, in the church world for a very long time. Uh, this song is set to a tune that this is also another debated part of this. Uh, it is... If you look in the hymnal, so in, in our hymnal here at Concord, the, uh, the bottom right of each page tells you what the, hymn, what the tune is, is called, what the tune that the song was written to is called. And the bottom left tells you who wrote the tune, or it says music written. Um, Nettleton is the name of the tune here. This was not the original uh, tune. However, it's what we have come to know, come thou fount as today. And, um, and so this tune was written in, in, uh, back in 1813 or so. Um, it, it was, it was uh, again, a, a debated point on whether or not it's a, it's a person by the name of Asahel Nettleton. Um, he was a poet, and he had many different publications. Uh, a lot of his works got published, and he, he came out with his own stuff uh, quite, quite often. But he was uh, never, never proved that he was the composer for the uh, actual music for this. But regardless, that's who they credit. And that's what we sing today. Uh, so with Come Thou Fount, it is page two in our hymnal here. And so you can see uh, there are two little, as kids call them today, hashtags. Uh, these are actually sharps in music. And uh, so with two sharps, that means we are in the key of D. And uh, this is three, four time signature, where just like last week with Be Thou My Vision, we have three beats and a quarter note carrying the beat, getting each beat. So there are three quarter notes in each measure, which is the exact same as last week, and we call that the waltz beat. So it's one, two, three, one, two, three, come thou fount of every blessing. One, two, three. So it, it's pretty self-explanatory. It's easily understood, not self-explanatory, but it is easier to understand when you know that. Um, so Come Thou Fount has a lot of language in it that we do not use, uh, a, a whole lot of language in it. And so there are also some verses in the original writing that we don't, we don't sing. But So for time's sake, I'm going to only cover the lyrics that we have in sing through in our hymnal um, however i would i would encourage you go read some of the other verses that we don't sing on that on, on in the hymnal because they are phenomenally written um just just wonderfully written uh pieces of of music and and just a an amazing message especially in uh one particular that talks about how we should long to get to the uh to heaven and so uh, all right, so we, we've covered the music theory part of it. Let's dive right into verse 1. It says, Come thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace, streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet sung by flaming tongues above, praise the mount I'm fixed upon it, mount of thy redeeming love. All right, so the opening line, uh, it says, Come thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. This is written with the idea of, of the message that James 1 uh, has. And so this is the giver of all good things. This is the, the, uh, the, the creator of all that is good in our life and in our world. It, every, good and, every good gift and, and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights. So James 1.17 uh, perfectly states that. And so we know the opening line of this song is very easily backed by Scripture. So the term, uh, I want to cover real quick, there's a, a difficult part to this 
to this song, um, there's a difficult part to this song where we don't use this this phrasing anymore. Um, I want to just spend a little bit of time. Streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. The next part, teach me some melodious sonnet sung by flaming tongues above. Y'all, I will be completely honest with you and say that I didn't fully, for a long time, I raised my eyebrows when I would sing that line because the the, the simplicity of our mind hears the word flaming tongues above and we're thinking immediate fire. We're thinking hot. We're thinking uh, just something that is not a very pleasant tone to it. However, what is is trying to be uh, delivered, the message that is trying to be delivered, it's not flame. It's not fire. It is a descriptor for the divine brightness that is that is um, coming from you know it, it, tongues above referring to angels and everyone in 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 heaven singing what we already know know what we're going to be proclaiming holy 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 so that is referring to the sonnet teach me some melodious sonnet sung by flaming tongues above this is really trying to get across to us the fact that we lack. A, a, a an ability to describe what it will be like to be before the face of God. This is trying to get us to understand that we are not capable of comprehending, of describing, of using our watered-down linguistic words to describe the goodness that will come from heaven. And so this is a call of anticipation. This is this is not so much a, a pretty please. This is a, an anticipatory, I cannot wait to be able to join in that sonnet, that holy, holy, holy. Praise the mount I'm fixed upon it, mount of thy redeeming love. So the original line here was, praise the mount I'm fixed upon it, mount of God's unchanging love. This is a song that I really wish people had left alone. Sometimes we, I say we, sometimes lyricists and, and publishers will change lines and songs to better sing, to, for us to better sing them. They flow a little bit better for the timing or maybe for particular beliefs or whatever the case may be. Lyrics are changed all the time, especially on songs this old. However, this is one that I feel strongly should have been left alone. Praise the mount, I'm fixed upon it. Praise the mount, I'm fixed upon it. I'm fixed upon it means I am locked in. My eyes are not leaving. My heart is not leaving. Fixed upon it to concrete. I'm concreted in my attention to this. Mount of thy redeeming love, or as I prefer it, Mount of God's unchanging love. The mount here refers to Golgotha. Let that sink in for a second. Praise the mount where everything took place. I am fixed upon it. The, the place of God's unchanging love. I broke down in tears when I started reading reading this and trying to to, to study a little bit further in this and I, and I hope this I hope that the weight of this is is ringing and making itself known in, in your watching. So verse two, I really love verse two uh, simply because it's got a lot of um, it's got a lot of helplessness in our part. Here I raise my Ebenezer. Hither by thy help I've come, and I hope by thy good pleasure safely to arrive at home. Jesus sought me when a stranger wandering from the fold of God. He, to rescue me from danger, interposed his precious blood. So the first line, um, Ebenezer, it's not talking about Scrooge, obviously. Um, 1 Samuel 7. Uh, that is 
that's exactly where that's coming from where Samuel helped the Hebrews uh, defeat the Philistines in, in Mizpah and the, he, they cried out and, and they said, you know, help us. And so Samuel helps them. They, they win the victory. They get the victory in the battle and he sets up a stone. The, the, the scripture literally says Samuel set up a stone and he called it Ebenezer. So in Hebrew, Ebenezer translates to stone of help so another way of singing this first line here i raise my ebenezer here i raise my call to help here i announce my helplessness and my reliance on christ it's like we're waving our white flag saying god we can't do this we are solely fixed and reliant on you here we raise our ebenezer i love that that is just such an appropriate lyric for how we, how we have to live our life. Hither by thy help I've come, and I hope by thy good pleasure safely to arrive at home. The last half of this verse, it, it just is so powerful. Jesus sought me when a stranger, wandering from the fold of God, he to rescue me from danger, interposed his precious blood. The last half really speaks to Ephesians 2, 12 and 13. I want to read that for you. I have it, I have it marked right here. Um, so Ephesians 2, 12 and 13, in, in, in the, the last half of that verse, in his own way, in Robinson's own way, he wrote down his interpretation of 12 and 13. Remember that you were at that time separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who formerly were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. And so when we read that, we have to acknowledge that we didn't we, it was nothing that we had done, but as Paul wrote right here, we have been brought near by the blood of Christ. It's nothing that we have done, and, and it's not even a chase that we made. We literally had to admit that we are dead. We are alone. We are useless without him. We are without purpose without our Heavenly Father in our life. Wandering from the fold of God, that just paints a picture of, of, a, of a, a rolling plain with, with animals, just a, just a fold of animals. And there's one off to the side. And as Scripture tells us, he leaves the 99 and seeks us out. He to rescue me from danger interposed his precious blood. All right, look, y'all, that word, interposed, rocks my world that word we don't think about too often because in the hymnal we read bought me with his precious blood that is such an elementary watered down version of what it's saying so i'm sticking with the original interposed by his precious blood. Interposed means to literally intervene between parties, two parties. And it states, if you search what interposed means on the dictionary website, it will state, inter intervene between two parties. The precious blood that was shed was the intervening body between the punishment for sin in its death and us. I, I still struggle with where to where to put this. Um, he to rescue me from danger. He knew what our what the end result was going to be without without that bloodshed. He knew where we were going, and so the blood interposed between the punishment of sin and us. 
guys, that is a grace and a love that just is unfathomable. I still struggle with verse 2. Verse 3. Oh, to grace, how great a debtor. Daily I am constrained to be. Let thy, let thy goodness like a fetter bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart. Lord, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. So in the past, I've talked about the language that was used there. Fetter is, is like a chain. Um, and so oftentimes when you study songs, what you don't see is when you, when you study the song and who wrote it, the lyrics can sometimes be kind of an autobiographical viewpoint at where that person's, the author's spiritual life was. And so the life of, of Robert Robinson was exactly as verse 3 is written. He was fatherless, and his mother sent him away to basically be a, a breadwinner at a very early age. He had to support, he had to... Go, he was an intern uh, for a barber, for a local barber. And uh, if I, hope, I just saw it freeze. I hope y'all caught that. Um, but so Robinson was, was at an early age, had, he had to grow up. And so in that, in that period of time before he sat under the, the tutelage of, another, of a pastor that, that was able to invest in him and God he, he felt God's calling into ministry in that time before that Robinson lived a life of debauchery I mean just complete nastiness filth sin all over it and he is admitting here in his writing that he is he is desperate for the goodness of God to no longer let him stray. He wants so bad to be chained to the goodness of God. Because as he states, he is prone to wonder. And he knows it. He feels it. He has done it. Prone to leave the God he loves. So here's my heart, Lord. Take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. 2 Corinthians 12, 9. It reminds us of the sufficiency of of God's grace to cover our weakness. So Paul says, Therefore I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. You may be saying, well, how does, what does that have to do with it? When we admit that we wonder, when we admit that we need that goodness, we admit that we have to have that chain, that fetter, to keep us near. We are admitting our weakness. And so despite, despite man's tendency to wonder, our daily tendency to wonder, 1 Peter 2, 24 and 25, I love this, hang on, reflects on the fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy. We know where this is going. He, Christ, himself, bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die in sin, might, might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed, for you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseers of your souls. When we are admitting that, when we are admitting that we, we are prone to wonder, we are prone to leave, and we know that God so loves us, the overseer of our soul and our shepherd. We know what he has done for us to relinquish us. But guys, the grace right there that, that we sing about, here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it. God, forgive me again. Seal it for thy courts above. Um, that last line should be a prayer that is echoed for all of our lives. God, here's my heart, Lord. Take and seal it. 
and seal it for your courts above. This song has been very heavy for me. Um, this song, other than the disagreeing scholars, I can look past it. However, between verse 2 and verse 3, guys, there is so, so much goodness, and it is so rich with conviction. And I hope you see that. When we sing, Come Thou Fount, it has such a lively, bold sound to it with such a heavy, heavy, reliant, dependent on Christ tone. And when we sing this, it needs to be no longer the way in which it was done before. When we hear it, when we worship with it, we are saying, God, you are worthy of these words. God, I cry out to you. And it is because of the fact that I recognize the blood that was interposed between what I deserve and what I have. So guys, I love you. I hope you have enjoyed this week as much as I have. I hope you are growing from this. I hope you're enjoying this. And um, yeah, I will be more than happy to answer any questions or, or, or hear any comments you have about this. And uh, I hope you all have a wonderful week. I look forward to seeing you again next Wednesday. Take care.